Hi, welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Jess Armin to talk all about the root causes of mental health issues. If, you, if you've never heard of Dr. Jess, then you really need to. He's putting together the healthcare puzzle, and that is to discover and eradicate the root causes and subsequent effects of chronic illnesses in adults and children, as well as to educate and empower patients and practitioners alike. Dr. Armin is one of the few healthcare practitioners worldwide specialising in the genetic SNPs, single nu nucleotide polymorphisms, with neuroendoimmunology, acquired mitochondrial dysfunction and cell wall integrity to identify hidden imbalances and he develops individualised treatment plans specific to the health history and physiology of the individual. Dr. Armin lectures all around the world, but particularly practitioners in the US and the UK and Australia, as well as treating patients all across the world too. He constantly researches about the latest findings in genetics and functional medicine, and his areas of specialisation include autism spectrum disorders, MTHFR and methylation issues, PANDAS, chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, um, and gastrointestinal imbalances like leaky gut. And Dr. Jess, I heard him speak around a year or two ago in Manchester, so it was in a, lo a local event where he came to teach practitioners, and I really loved his work and have been following him for, um, since that point. And Dr. Jess was kind enough to actually create a presentation for us today, which you can follow along with on YouTube. So if you want to watch that presentation, will also be linked in the episode show notes for you to download as well, which is great. But we discussed the cell danger response, so CDR, what exactly that is and how it can be driving some of these conditions why the cell membrane is actually the brain of the cell and the things that influence it with nutrition, lifestyle, infections, mold, epigenetics and common SNPs that can be contributing to mood imbalances like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, neurotransmitter imbalances, so the excitatory or the inhibitory neurotransmitters, what we mean by that and some symptoms that you may be dealing with when these are out of whack. So I love Dr. Jess. He's so funny. And throughout the, the podcast episode, he made like a ton of jokes and we were chatting for a while afterwards as well. So if I'm laughing quite loud. Apologies. I tried to move back from my microphone, but I think his whole approach to health is so optimistic and you can tell he's so passionate about the work um, driven by his history, trying to help his son who was struggling with some of these things as well. So that really comes across and he's so passionate about mental illness but finding the root cause of that, which I think is amazing. So again, the slides for this presentation are available in the show notes if you're not following along on YouTube, but let's get into the episode now. I'm so excited for you to hear this. Vivian was uh, kind enough to uh, uh, discuss with me beforehand what you guys would like to uh, learn about, okay? And I happen to be, um, you know, I, I, my practice is uh, caring for people with complex multifactorial illnesses. Um, with a, a, a you know a specialty in neuropsychiatric disease, um, autism, autoimmune diseases, and so forth. Uh, so the reason, uh, <laughs> just to let you know that I've been in practice about 43 years, and I'm, I really am from Brooklyn, New York. And the last time I was in the UK, of course, you know, I, I spent 30 years trying to get rid of that accent. <laughs> and a young and a young waitress was like, uh, "You're from where?" I said, "Oh, well, I'm from Brooklyn." You don't sound like it. I said, you, you want to hear that accent? She said, we like it. So I said, you want me to talk like when I talk to my mother, right? <laughs> so when I talked about that I'm from Brooklyn, this is actually what I sound like. You know, so, so you leave in Brooklyn, forget about it. You know, so it took me a lot of years to get rid of the accent. Who knew that people would like that? Well, anyway, uh, throughout my career, I've, I've done a lot of different things. I'm a registered nurse. I'm also a doctor of chiropractic. I'm also an ENT paramedic. I've got... Um, uh, degrees in forensic medicine, forensic examination, lots of uh, certifications in various uh, portions of alternative medicine, so I won't bore you with that. I do have a lot of nicknames, though, some of them not so complimentary. Okay, but uh, mainly I'm known around the world as the Sherlock Holmes of chronic diseases and the neurotransmitter whisperer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting way I got that one. <laughs> but the reason I'm interested in neuropsych problems is I have a uh, son with... Um, with schizophrenia. And uh, when I saw this young man who is uh, 
who is incredibly intelligent, uh, very glib. I mean, this kid, you know, read Dante's Inferno at 10 years of age for fun and was explaining it to me. I know I had a special uh, little guy with me. But uh, when this befell him, when this happened, I did what every good dad does. I took him to the psychiatrist. And subsequently, he was snowed down with so many medicines that he would sit on the couch all day doing this. And frankly, my Jesse wasn't my Jesse anymore. Uh, and I noticed that in, in the mental health arena, that we as healthcare providers, uh, and I mean doctors, we look at mental illness. And honestly, we're the cause of people suffering in silence. Because we call them crazy, we call them nutters. We essentially tell people who have anxiety, depression, that, well, you know, you just have stress. You know, you just... You, know, you just can't handle your life. So here's a pill or here's a therapist or, or just, you know, just get over it. Okay. And I decided, uh, especially with my son, I kind of looked up at spirit and said, <laughs> this disease is messing with the wrong daddy. Okay. And I went on a campaign of finding out why things happen. And I had a lot of basic training there, but I wanted it to stop the suffering and I wanted to end the stigma because all mental illness of whatever ilk is physiologic in origin. It's not a, it's not you're not being able to handle your life. Uh, there's, it's multifactorial. We have more of it now and I'll, I'll show you why. Okay, and this is what Vivian asked me to do. And I said, ha ha, I know exactly, I'll show you why. Okay, and let's realize that what you may be feeling comes from your body rather than your mind you know, rather than your inability to handle life. You're not of poor stock or anything. This is physiologic. By the way, my son Jesse right now is a graphic artist. He's doing very well. He has his own business. Okay, and he is, in fact, my hero. Okay, so, you know, I, <laughs> I lecture all over the world. Okay, I, I, I treat people all over the world. I go all different places and lecture. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I can explain things really, 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 you know, with big, long words and so forth. And guess what? You'll be impressed that I can pronounce polysyllabic terms, but that's not the way to do that here, okay? So remember that Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, or if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't know it well enough. So let's go into the basis of all illness, okay? Let's really start at the base. And this is called something called a cell danger response, okay? Dr. Robert Navio, who's an MD, PhD, a few years back wrote a book, wrote a, <laughs> could have been a book, okay, wrote a paper that put together everything that injures a cell, how a cell heals itself, and why sometimes cells don't heal, okay? And he called it the cell danger response. And if you really wanna get fancy, it's an evolutionarily conserved metabolic process that protects cells and hosts from harm. It's caused by, by encountering chemical, physical, or biological threat that exceeds the capacity of the cells for homeostasis. Okay, you impressed? No, okay. <laughs> I don't blame you, all right? So guess what? Let's talk about what actually happens. Because let's remember that everything in the body happens in the cell. You know, people, I'm also a genetic expert, so people think that methylation happens over here, coconutization happens over there, biopterin happens over here, the detox happens behind me. No, everything happens within the confines of a cell. And once we get that concept correct, then realizing that if we get a cell to work, we fix the body because if you get a bunch of cells together, you have tissue. If you get a bunch of tissue together, you have organs. If you get a bunch of organs together, you have a body. Okay, so let's do this simply. The cell danger response is the metabolic response of the cell to protect itself and thereby you from harm. Notice the bear uh, protecting the uh, wolf, okay? It's the way that you reestablish homeostasis. Homeostasis is that balance that keeps you heavy. I'm sorry, keeps you steady. <laughs> sorry, Freudian slip. All right, so if you want to be healthy, health is not this, health is kind of this. All right, but it's within certain parameters, and that's homeostasis. And everything happens within the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. Most of what I'm going to be talking about is incredibly complex, but I'm going to explain it so you understand it. And guess what? If you understand it this way, you will allow yourself to heal because you don't need to know all the various processes because guess what? The body does it itself. In the mitochondria is how you create your energy, which is called ATP. If that isn't created, you don't live. So 
what the cell danger response is, it's enough of an assault that it exceeds your available resources. Simple as that, okay? This, I made, my, I made this up myself. I, you know, it took me an hour to find that cell with a sad face. Okay, oh yes. Okay, so cute. So, hmm. Okay, so anyway, these are the things that activate the cell danger response, and this is what injures the cell equally. That'll make sense to you, the heavy metals, plastics, benzene, heat salt, yada, yada, yada. This things, those things will injure a cell. I don't think we have any, too much argument about that. How about mold, fungi, um, bacteria, parasites, viruses? They can injure cells. I don't think we have too much of an argument about that either. But guess what? Dr. Navio proved on a scientific basis that all the psychological, emotional, and spiritual assaults will injure a cell just as badly, okay? So yelling, abuse, non-nurturing childhoods, PTSD, rape, um, all of the things that you can think of that, you know, you have a, you know, a, a poor relationship, all these things that we call stress are those things that injure a cell as much as microbes, as much as chemical and physical uh, assaults on the cell. So. When everybody says it's just stress, you can take that paper and shove it right up their nose. Uh, and I'm from Brooklyn, so that's kind of a thing, you know? Okay, so when the cell danger response activates, it results in a cascade of changes in your cells, okay? And what happens is those the factors that keep you balanced, that we call the homeostatic mechanisms, those are interfered with for a little while. So things like a cellular electron flow in the mitochondria, oxygen consumption that creates your energy, uh, the cell wall integrity, cell membrane integrity, cellular fluidity, your, your ability to hold on to vitamins, and your ability to get rid of heavy metals are impeded for a short period of time. Other really, you know, biochemical things like redox, lipodynamic creation of proteins, yada, 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 they're impeded for a short period of time. Then, when the danger is passed, there's a sequence of anti-inflammatory and regenerative pathways that reverse the cell danger response and promote healing, okay? There is something interesting that happened. He discovered that when the cell danger responses are chronic or multiple, that the effect of the, those impediments are not added up, they're synergized, which means they're much worse. And you get to a point where those mechanisms stop working and healing becomes impossible unless you treat not only the root causes, but also those other effects that you're seeing as symptoms. I'll tell you a little secret. The reason that we have so much chronic illness right now is because most healthcare providers, doctors mainly, you know, medical physicians, treat with an acute care mindset. In other words, if I get rid of the root cause, the body will take care of itself. If you have strep throat, if I kill the bug, the body will just get better. Well, normally that's what happens. But if you have chronic Lyme disease, if you have chronic EBV or chronic uh, a, a viral infections or chronic parasites, they will not allow the cell to heal. So when it becomes chronic and all you do is take care of the root cause, because of the chronic cell danger response, the body doesn't heal itself because cells don't work. This has given rise to the common wisdom that when you want your Lyme disease, you can never cure it. That's nonsense. If you treat both ends of the scale, okay, both ends of the body, you'd fix it. Because what happens is, the chronic cell danger response creates the root of all evil. So let me ask you, what is the root of all evil? And everybody says, money. I was like, no. Okay. <laughs> the love of money is the root of all evil. If you look at the Bible. And anyway, the root of all evil is inflammation. This is a concept that you really need to embrace because we tend to use um, inflammation as just, oh, you've got inflammation. <laughs> well, guess what? It's important, all right? And inflammation creates all the suffering that we tend to face. Now, at this particular thing, I know you can't read all of this, but if you look at this website, which is livelovefruit.com, and find this how inflammation affects the body, you will see that inflammation affects everything. Okay, so in the brain, it can cause autism, depression, poor memory, Alzheimer's, MS, chronic inflammation in the skin will cause acne, uh, eczema, and so forth. And you'll see all the various conditions that will be caused by chronic inflammation. So if chronic inflammation is caused by chronic cell danger response, which has been caused by those root causes that we spoke about, all the things that create the cell danger response, what you have to do, really think about it, 
is take care of those root causes and what they've done to the body. And guess what? Inflammation will start dropping. Okay. And once inflammation drops, all these things start going away because your body has an innate ability to heal itself. So inflammation is getting a lot of attention, even in Time Magazine. And it goes by different names, like chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is usually associated with biotoxin illness, but it really can be from one or more root causes. Okay, and chronic inflammation is, this is what's causing all of the issues that we're facing, cardiovascular issues, stomach issues, diabetes, metabolic disorders. And think about it, cardiovascular, atherosclerosis, which, starts, which creates uh, cardiopulmonary diseases, is an inflammatory process. Okay, that's what creates the inflammation inside the, inside the vessels that creates them, makes them smaller. Okay, but the biggest target is the nervous system, okay, which is why we start getting more autism, anxiety, OCD, migraines, so forth and so on. Okay, the chronic inflammation caused by chronic cell danger response that was initiated by those root causes is the base reason for all of these symptoms. And in the studies that were done by Dr. Navio, he noted, he noted that all chronic illnesses, autoimmune problems, degenerative disorders, neuropsychiatric problems, autism, are all caused by the chronic cell danger response. So this is the basis of all illness and all chronic illness. And just to make it easier, chronic inflammation is the reason for autoimmune diseases. Do you know something? Autoimmune diseases don't exist. Shh, don't tell anybody, okay? Because they won't believe you. So I have Hashimoto's. Yes, you do. But when you say Hashimoto's, you say, I have it forever. Not necessarily. If you truly had a condition that your body attacked itself, why now? Why is it attacking you at 35? Why is it attacking you at you know, 15? Why do you have rheumatoid arthritis at a certain times or eczema at certain times? Guess what? If it has to be from environmental factors or other factors that are initiating a certain cascade of events that are resulting in so autoimmunity as an entity, I don't know. So the other thing that is not paid attention to, we talk about cellular function, is the cell membrane integrity, okay, up here, okay? And because we start thinking of the cell membrane as a wall, but guess what? It's not just a wall. Yes, it's a phospholipid bilayer, but it has all the proteins. It has all, anything that has to get into, into the cell, out of the cell, okay, any signaling that's done, your immune system does all the signaling at the cells. The receptors are all here. And if we pay attention to the health of the cell membrane and the health of the intracellular things, if you will, okay, then you're going to start getting healthy no matter what it is you're facing. Okay, the cell membrane's permeability allows bad stuff to go in, good stuff to, uh, bad stuff to go out, good stuff to come in. Okay, allows for you to send messages. Okay, and this is uh, neural impulses, contains various proteins so that all the various functions of the individual specialized cell can work, okay, and it has the receptors for, to provide signaling for various biological functions. In other words, really, the cell membrane is the master of the body, not the nucleus. By the way, I did write a book uh, with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Lambert in Australia, okay, and it's called Leaky Gut, Leaky Cells, Leaky Brain. It's available on Amazon in the UK and around the world. It's also, uh, we also translated into Japanese. Okay, and it really kind of explains all of this. You can get it on Kindle for very, for very minimal money. Um, and if you really wanted to dive into this whole area, that's the way to do it. Okay, anyway, I was also asked to talk a little bit about genetics versus epigenetics, okay? And uh, I wanted to kind of put this into perspective because when we start putting the genetic predispositions in the proper place of the genetic information, you need to know a couple of things. Number one, our genetics are our genome, okay, our permanent stuff, okay? So we have a genome, we have an epigenome. The genome is kind of etched in stone, okay? The epigenome refers to the study of things that you can actually change, okay? Yes, you can actually influence. These are all your biochemical processes that produce neurotransmitters, various enzymes, and so forth. So. The epigenetics you can think of as how we express our permanent stuff. And also you should know that this is what we have control over. Okay, so the epigenetic expressions, and you'll hear me say things differently, because if I'll talk about anxiety, let's say, I won't say the word anxiety, I'll say excitation. Because anxiety is 
it got a stigma attached to it, but what are we really talking about? The nervous system being excited, okay? If I say you have anxiety, it's almost incurable. If I tell you that, I'll give you a better example. If I say that you have schizophrenia, in your head, you're going to say, oh, gosh, my life is over. I'm going to have to take medicines. I won't be able to work. Ugh. Okay? But if I say, you know those kind of voices and all that stuff that's been bothering you? Well, that's because you have leaky gut syndrome, and that's creating a whole mess of inflammation. And that leaky gut syndrome is brought on by, and I'm, I'm actually talking about a case in my head, uh, of a little eight-year-old girl who had hallucinations. This is brought on by Lyme, chronic Lyme disease, anaplasma, uh, HHV6, and candida. And the only thing you'd say to me is that, okay, doc, how do we fix it? I just told you I had the same thing. One's permanent, one's fixable. Same thing, okay? These are expressions of your epigenetics, okay? And they're influenced by environments, toxins, microbes, diet, lifestyle, nutrients. In other words, we have control over this stuff and that's not sort of like what causes a cell danger response. Shh, don't tell anybody. Okay, so when everybody, everybody's into genetics, they're picking up these various uh, reports and so forth. They don't even know what they're looking at, okay? I'm homozygous this, I'm heterozygous that. Okay, let me tell you what it means, okay? This is from uh, Stratagene, which is uh, courtesy of Dr. Ben Lynch. Okay, I actually invented Stratagene. I actually created it, and Dr. Ben uh, developed it. Okay, so this is what you're looking at means. So when you're looking at a gene, it creates an enzyme, okay? Enzymes are how we process things in our body. It's done through enzymes, okay? In order to get an enzyme to work, you need cofactors, vitamins and minerals, okay? And in Stratagene, you can see what the cofactors are. You can see the factors that increase the activity of the enzyme or decrease the activity of the enzyme. When you see yellow or heterozygous, it means that that particular gene which gives rise to a particular enzyme is working without anything else happening at about 60% of what it should be doing. If you see red, it's working at about 20%. Now remember that if you're looking at a gene, NTHFR, there's 50, count them, five zero variations. So if you're able to look at a study that has 15 of them, and you only have one polymorphism, which this is called a SNP, or a single nucleotide polymorphism, that's what SNP means, or I just say polymorphism, you're looking at how much of the reductase activity, the activity of MTHFR is affected by only one polymorphism as opposed to all 15. Okay, so what you're looking at is the possible function of the enzyme that may express itself given an oxidative stress load. You're born like this, okay? There's no problems. It's all the environmental factors that make this express. So when you're looking at the SNPs, think of them as highways, okay? Think of the normal as being an eight-lane highway, the heterozygous being a four-lane highway, and the homozygous being a two-lane highway. But since I'm talking to the UK, think about normals being an M road, the heterozygous as being a B road, and the homozygous as being a C road. I've been on your C roads, okay? There's not a lot of room. <laughs> it's like I'm driving in the Midlands, right? Going on a C road, Woof. two cars come together. We got to get out, we have to have tea, we have to decide who's going to go, okay? And up in Scotland, forget about it. You know, they just drive over you. Okay, it's no problem at all because you go either way, you're going to either go up a mountain or down a mountain. <laughs> it's okay. I like it. But this is what it really means, okay? So if you have a lot of traffic, obviously the two-lane highway or the zero is going to get blocked up a lot quicker than the B road or A road. It's going to get blocked up quicker than a M road. Okay, and what is that traffic? Bacteria, heavy metals, viruses, parasites, food allergens, yada, yada, yada. If you think about it like that, you got it. Because if you want the pathways to work, what do you do? Get rid of the traffic, okay? And also you want to give the pathways what it needs to work. You can't change the SNP, you can't change the polymorphism. When somebody says, I treat MTHFR, I wanna reach out and crush their throat. I'm from Brooklyn, remember, that's a thing, all right? Because you can't take a polymorphic MTHFR and turn it into something normal. What you could do is optimize the function, okay? And if you have an emerald, do you think you can get enough traffic to block it up? Well, I've been on your emeralds too, and that sometimes that queue can get kind of long, okay? And guess what, you can. So just because you're looking at a pathway and all looks green doesn't mean you're good to go. You can certainly have enough traffic to block that up. So I was also asked to talk about methylation because everybody's methylation crazy. All right, let's talk, what is methylation? 
Okay, methylation is a biological process that you take methyl groups and put them on various parts of the DNA. And the effect of that is it makes certain genes work and other genes it turns, it either upregulates it or downregulates it. In other words, it doesn't change the DNA sequence. It doesn't change what it, where it is and what it does. It just turns things on and off. Well, that's important because our bodies work a certain way, okay? And the important of, met, of methylation is, like I said, is to actually turn on or turn off various genes for proper enzymatic function. And it's incredibly complex to understand it's an entirety. But guess what? You don't have to do anything about it. All you have to do is make sure that you optimize your pathways and the body will methylate on its own. Methylation usually occurs from SAMe being, SAMe being recycled, okay, but we tend to concentrate on things like methyl B12 and anything that has a methyl in it, trimethylglycine, dimethylglycine, methyl B12, methylfolate, and that's kind of the wrong way to go about it because methylation occurs on its own. We only should take care of what we have control over, okay? By the way, if you really want to know about genetics, <laughs> go to the Roche Biochemical Pathways, okay, which is an interactive PDF. This is uh, from a different lecture that I did, and I was pointing out in that pathway where methylation occurred, okay? And concentrating on a single pathway is usually a recipe for disaster because here's all the biochemical pathways, okay? If you had this on a poster, you'd need like two or three walls to put it on. Okay, this is where I started studying this. Oh, that's how all this hair loss happened, okay? But as you can see, methylation is only a part of everything. So if you look at things more globally, if you look at things from the 30,000 foot point of view, you're gonna be more correct in, in, in fixing something than trying to micromanage the biochemistry, which by itself is an impossibility, okay? So understand this, this is something you should take away. You can understand physiology right down to the quantum level, okay? Which can only intervene at the global level. I can't put B6 into my body and say, I want you to go to this pathway. It doesn't happen, okay? You look at things more globally, and that's how you fix stuff, okay? So the proper use of epigenetic data is to look at things in the, in the greater scheme. So this is a biopterin pathway. As a matter of fact, it's my, bio, my, my biopterin pathway, okay? So if I wanted to know why I have anxiety or excitation, okay, what is the probability here? So I'll look at my pathway and say, well, here's tyrosine, which creates L-dopa, which creates dopamine, okay? which should then create norepinephrine and epinephrine. This is my excitatory neurotransmitters. But because I have a lot of polymorphisms in MAO and COMT and, and for me also DBH, okay, I'm gonna have a backup of dopamine if I have a reason to have high dopamine. And that may cause things like OCD, ADD, anxiety, depression, paranoia, schizophrenia, and this is a major reason for autism. Now, it's not, I'm not blaming the pathways, okay? What I'm doing is like, why is it like that? Why is my dopamine up? I have a predisposition, this is the predisposition. So when you have genetic information, you look at it as advisory and what could happen, and then if you, something has already happened, you might know what to start doing about it, okay? So there was a study that was done in, um, in uh, the newborn screening at autism, for autism, search of candidate biomarkers was in biomarkers in medicine uh, in 2013. And what they did was they studied kids with autism. They, they, they went back to their genetics and said, hey, uh, we can maybe pre predict autism. So this is what they did. Uh, what they did was they found that in certain groups of um, genes, if they were head SNPs or polymorphisms, that it may create things like um, gastrointestinal problems or autoimmune disorders. And those things would cause autism. The benefit of this particular study is to say that, yes, if these people have these problems, these kids, that they will have a tendency or a predisposition to autism, not to say they actually are born with autism, okay? So when you have an oxidative stress load, it might affect the body in a certain way that gives rise to certain, certain things that can result in autism or mental illness, okay? That's the proper use of the data. Sometimes you can use it as, you know, you have a new baby and you say, okay, I can look at this and maybe I'll be very careful about how we feed the baby or be careful about maybe not getting immunizations or maybe get immunizations, or if you're gonna have immunizations, spreading them out. Okay, There's, this is how you use the advisory information. The problem is people will look at this and say, 
well, I have the diagnosis of autism, and then they give up and say, you know, this is you know, my lot in life. The genetic predisposition only means it's a possibility and it should be used in advisory. Um, the result of a lot of these genetic predispositions expressing can be leaky gut syndrome, okay, or, you know, a tendency to have higher dopamine. And if you have that, you're going to start using up your serotonin really bad, and your serotonin counterbalances dopamine, and you're going to start getting symptoms. There, is a, there are lots of studies these days on the gut-brain axis. And what that means is that medical science has finally agreed with what we've known as naturalists for decades, that if you have a bad gut, you're going to have a bad brain. Simple. They have to do studies. We knew it. Okay. And the fact is that a leaky gut syndrome GI dysfunction will create a situation if you have the genetic predisposition to lead towards neurotransmitter imbalance that is the cause of mental illness. Mental illness is how neurotransmitter imbalances express. Okay, if you, if you own that statement, all of a sudden, you don't have a psychiatric illness. You have a medical condition that needs to be managed, okay, or needs to be resolved. And yes, you can resolve these issues. No doubt, no matter how bad you think it is, they're resolvable. By the way, leaky gut syndrome in its basis, once you breach the gut barrier, because of the immune system sitting right under it, it starts overactivating. What the first thing you're gonna start seeing is food allergies and food intolerances, and then you'll start seeing immune system abnormalities as time goes on because of chronic inflammation, that may come up as autoimmunity. How many of you out there who have eczema or psoriasis, when you've cleaned up your diet, it goes away? Gee, I wonder what the connection is, right? Now, it also will give, will not only kick up autoimmunity, but it also will kick up dysautonomia. Dysautonomia, things like POTS, postural static tachycardia syndrome, and other syndromes where the autonomic nervous system, the automatic nervous system, is being interfered with because by the time inflammation has been around for a long time, it starts affecting the receptors. And yes, it can be resolved. And it does take a multifactorial approach because just diet's not going to do it. You need to usually intervene different ways at that time, but it can be reversed. And they have things called psychobiotics now. Okay, you'll look in Amazon and you'll see different probiotics that either chew up histamine real well, uh, or are considered mood probiotics, they're noticing now that the various probiotics will affect various uh, psychological or physiological functions. And if you wanted to look it up and understand it, it's in biological psychiatry. And what day, when is this done? I don't know. Oh, 2013. By the way, it's 2020. How come this is only coming out now? Because it was in the deep science and we won't get into politics, okay? The neurotransmitters are affected by, uh, by what we've been talking about. What neurotransmitters are are simply substances that transmit neural impulses. That's all, that's all we're talking about. Okay, and we, we either have excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitters. Okay, we have a balance of them that keep us awake and allow us to relax. Okay, and there's a, uh, there's a thing I call the brain wall, which has a chart um, that has lists of the excitatory neurotransmitters and what symptoms you see when they're high and low. For instance, when epinephrine or adrenaline's high, you can have sleep troubles, anxiety, tremors, and when it's low, you can have fatigue, lower focus, weight gain, and so forth. Uh, ADD, attention deficit disorder, has two main reasons. One, a lack of norepinephrine and something like old phenylethylamine <clears throat> on the bottom right, or the brain is moving so fast that the person has the attention span of a gnat. Same thing, same expression, two different causations, okay? Your inhibitory neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA, too high, and you get things like road rage, hot flashes, and so forth. By the way, hormonally, wanna get rid of hot flashes? Have to raise serotonin. Shh, that's another little secret. Okay, but you have too little, you can have anxiety, insomnia, depression, uncontrolled appetite, usually for carbohydrates, 
things like chips, uh, potatoes, stuff like that. When you have cravings for sugars, that's usually candida, but when you have cravings for potatoes and stuff like that, you're usually looking for serotonin. And if you have unexplained gastrointestinal symptoms, lots of times it's serotonin because serotonin is made in the gut and is the major neurotransmitter of the enteric nervous system. So really what I did was put in this little chart of mine uh, that we call the brain wall, uh, various parts that, you know, we uh, looked at various parts of the brain and where the neurotransmitters got involved. So let's talk about the prefrontal cortex. This is where ADD lives. Um, the prefrontal cortex is the area where you have attention, judgment, impulse control. When it's dysfunctional, you have distractibility, impulsivity, poor judgment, laziness, lack of forethought, and everything one calls a teenager. Okay? Do you know why teenagers act like teenagers? Because their prefrontal cortex doesn't finish developing until they're about 25. That's why they do dumb, th dumb, dumb things, because they really don't have the capacity just yet to utilize their uh, critical thinking. And dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine are what work here. In the anterior cingulate is where OCD and ODD live. And this is your balancer. This is what controls your flexibility and so forth. And serotonin is the major uh, neurotransmitter that works here. In the basal ganglia is where anxiety lives. And depending on where the dysfunction is, right or left, you may either have external anxiety, yelling, screaming, homicidal thinking, okay, or internal anxiety, where you're just shaking on the inside, but you may have suicidal thinking, thinking of self-mutilation, okay? And guess what? GABA is what controls this. And GABA is GABA butyric acid, which is the chief inhibitory neurotransmitter of the mammalian nervous system. Um, when you drink alcohol, or take benzodiazepines, it stimulates the GABA A receptor to release GABA. It's not actually giving you GABA. And that's so overused that that um, receptor tends to get injured after a while, okay? So also it's kind of a fast on, fast off thing. Uh, if, you were, if you gave yourself GABA, if you were able to give yourself GABA, which half the times you can't get your hands on it anymore, okay, because they used to have phenylated GABA. Uh, there are liposomal GABAs out there which will get directly into the brain, that would tend to calm things down. But you still have to get to the root cause and fix what the problems are. This would be more of a, of a Band-Aid. Depression lives in the, in the thalamic and limbic system, which is on this side of the brain. If you remember Princess Leia from Star Wars, if you want to know where the thalamic limbic system is, just remember her hair being like this. Okay, that's where it is. Um, that's your emotional filter. That's where uh, you have experiences and you tag their importance. Okay, this is where depression lives. This is where you may have, a, have appetite or sleep problems, decreased sex drive, uh, de increased negative thinking, and serotonin, again, is what control th control th controls things here. Uh, by the way, when you smell things and you get you reminded of emotions, well, that's because the molecules go up through the cribriform plate in there and stimulate the thalamic limbic system, and that's where... Well, and that's where you have all your memories of various emotions, and that's why different smells evoke different emotions, okay? The temporal lobe, which is at the floor of the brain, is uh, the left side processes language and does your, all your you know, uh, solid things, where the right side is more the artsy area of facial recognition and so forth. Uh, when there's dysfunction on the left-hand side, the, you tend to see aggression, fighting, sensitive dislikes. Right side is difficulty with faces and decoding voices and so forth. Uh, we all know that um, abused children tend to be abusers themselves. One of the reasons is because most abusers are right-handed. So when they strike a child, they tend to strike it on the left side of the head. And over time, they develop left temporal lobe dysfunction. And this is one of the reasons for the aggression. Knowing that, if you had the capability of fixing a brain, which can, okay, you could start reversing that particular problem. You can take psychological things and work them from therapy, but you have to work them from the basis and from the physiology on up also. You want to fix an autistic child. All the occupational therapy and physical therapy in the world will help, but it doesn't correct the problem. And sometimes you do very well, but most times you're fighting 
a, a consistent battle. You have to treat autism from the problems that caused it, which is the, uh, that caused, which is usually the toxins or microbes and so forth, and fix what that did to this, that poor child's body, okay, as well as retraining them. And the principle here is you have to look at the neurotransmitters, the hormones, and the immune system. This is a system called neuroimmunology. So what can cause, what affects neurotransmitter balance is membrane instability. In other words, you need a solid membrane, like we talked about, okay, and stress. How does stress affect your neurotransmitters, which affects your mood and causes anxiety, depression, and so forth? Well, here's a little animation for you. By the way, this is what stressors do to a cell. It looks familiar, doesn't it? Hmm. Okay. Anyway, this is how mirrors usually work. Okay, I'm going to talk just about dopamine. It's dopamine is made inside the axon of the neuron, okay, and it's broken down by MAO. But what it does is it fills in these little vesicles. Think of them as warehouses. When a message has to go through, okay, the vesicles come down, they release dopamine into the, uh, into the synapse, okay, and dopamine goes over to the receptors transmit the message, and then it gets broken down by COMT or gets reabsorbed, okay? So this is optimal activity. Okay, the stores are full and everything is good with the world. So when stressors hit, there's an increase in the amount of neurotransmitter activity and demand. So even though the stores are depleting, you don't even see it, you don't feel it, okay? Because you have enough for the demand, there's a lot of high activity, now this is great when you have a fight or flight, but think of this happening over a long period of time, okay? And even though the stores are dropping, okay, and the activity is high, you don't feel this. With chronic stress, if the neurotransmitters aren't made as quickly as they're needed, and the stores continue to decrease, and de continue to decrease, and you get optimal looking activity. And you still don't see this, you don't have any symptoms at all. Even though everything's beginning to drop now. Okay, and when the neurotransmitter stores become depleted, then there's improper communication. This is where you see symptoms. By this time, you have no storage, your activity is low, and that's where you see symptoms. So by the time you get symptoms, you're already way behind the curve. Your storage of the target neurotransmitters are gone. So if it happens to be low serotonin, okay, you don't have any serotonin. If you look at people's neurotransmitter studies, they tend to be ubiquitously low, and even in anxiety, they're being excited by other issues. Okay, well anyway, that is my very fast uh, speech about uh, mental illness and um, physiology. But, okay, I don't know if I, uh, if I answered everything, so I'll let, <laughs> I'll let Vivian ask me questions, because she's been very patient, yeah. and I talk very fast. Yeah. And I will, um, I will keep my mouth shut and answer questions. <laughs> yeah, that was absolutely amazing. Um, I was just sat there. And I've heard some of these things before, but the way that you explain it, it just resonates. So thank you so much for that. And yes, I have a few questions. Um, the first would be on your son and with his health and his struggles, what were the top things that made the biggest difference for him? Like, did you uncover um, some chronic infections? Like, what were the biggest... Um, underlying drivers? The underlying drivers were Lyme disease and parasites, uh, massive leaky gut syndrome, uh, and it, he did have to be controlled with medications at some point. Um, we went through a, he, he was incredibly, incredibly cooperative. Um, we thought it was pandas at one time and he had his tonsils out. I mean, I feel bad about certain things that he had to go through, but what I will say is, um, He's, you know, doing incredibly well now, and it was uh, a struggle. It was, you know, he had, if, if you could call it the worst case scenario of everything, um, that is exactly what happened. And he still has his struggles, okay, because, you know, he's, he's exposed to this environment, okay? And once you create those pathways that create certain symptoms, they tend to want to they tend to want to, you know, get it uh, stimulated at times. And um, he recently uh, was at his brother's house and got a, and didn't realize his brother had house had and he was taking care of his brother's dogs while his, uh, while he was away. 
didn't realize that there was so much mold in his house. But that was a real problem. Okay, that created some real nasty problems. And realizing that it was mold, you know, we could intervene, but once that starts happening, it is not an easy thing to, to work with. It can be done, and it is done, but, you know, fortunately, we could identify what the exacerbating cause were. You know, it's sort of like a migraine. You know, nobody can cure a migraine. Okay, what you do is control all the triggers of the migraine. Because once the pathways are set up, what you have to do is stop whatever's triggering it. But even if you control all those triggers, that doesn't mean that if you get a stimulation like, like mold or something, that part of that syndrome isn't going to be those migraines again. Definitely. There's always going to be like that chink in the armor or someone's weak link genetically. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. For some exactly. people, it's um, digestive issues. For some people, it's back pain or migraines. Yeah, we all have that. We all just have to figure out what it is and try to manage it as well as we can do in this toxic world unfortunately um yeah and speaking of mold i recently discovered that's something that i'm dealing with and i've had a quite a, a long health history of um hormonal imbalances hair loss skin issues and more mast cell related issues so histamine food sensitivities um and digestive issues and I went to a seminar a couple of months ago. It's been on my radar, you know, when like something you see it multiple times and you hear, keep hearing more about it and it starts to resonate with you. And I did a test and I think it was mycophenolic acid was like off the charts and um, really high. And I'm moving hopefully this month at the end of the month. So I'm getting out of the environment. But what are some recommendations that for me selfishly that you'd want me to sure. um, be aware of? All right. Well, you're talking about both? Recommendations, okay. Uh, even if you, uh, Dr. Shoemaker is, um, mm -hmm. is the big expert, but uh, nothing works unless you get rid of the mold, okay? Uh, so they, there are little, um, there are plates you can buy uh, on Amazon uh, that you can just put around your house and that, that will give you a general idea of how bad the mold is, okay? Um, if you're gonna treat yourself for mold, and let's say you can get you know, control over the environment, and I'll, I'll tell you a little secret about how to take care of that. <clears throat> what you wanna do is use a binder, okay, to help pull the mold out of the liver. Um, it, it depends on who you talk to, but zeolite works really well. That would be things like zeolite or toxic prevent. Uh, one of the best binders out there is made by Quicksilver Scientific, it's called Ultra Binder. Kind of has a lot of different uh, binders in it. Um, some people will use cholestyramine. Uh, that is a good binder, but it's very, very harsh. Uh, the other thing to do is um, some people will use glutathione. Okay, uh, the difficulty in using glutathione is some people do very well with it, and some people don't do very well with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you're doing very well with it, that's great. If you're going to take glutathione, it should be a liposomal form because that gets into the cells. Okay, but if you don't do well with it, it means that the recycling mechanism, when you create glutathione in your body, the active glutathione, it oxidizes. Okay, that's its end point. And we have a recycling mechanism that brings it from that used up state to a usable state again. If that, if that system is not working well, you're gonna build up your oxidized glutathione and that blocks your mitochondrial function and you start dropping the amount of energy you're creating and your cells slow down and stop working, which means increases your symptoms. Okay, um, handling all the parameters of cellular function, making sure that you get vitamins and minerals into the cells, making sure that your cell uh, membranes have enough fatty acids in order to create the cell membranes, okay, making sure that you're absorbing well. This all comes down to absorption and uh, d digestion and absorption. In any chronic illness or any even acute illness, you're gonna develop leaky gut syndrome. Okay, you don't have to test for it, you can just treat it because the treatment of uh, leaky gut is so benign that even if you're wrong, you're not hurting anyone. And it essentially means that you have to improve your digestion, usually with digestive enzymes or any other methodology, just chewing and that kind of stuff. Um, recreating a mucus layer and helping the cells heal. Okay, plus recreating a good microbiome. Uh, in mold illness, there are a lot of different ways of, of binding the mold, but um, it kind of depends on who you talk to. 
here's something that, that seems to work. Um, and I've been recommending it for even people who are afraid of the coronavirus. Uh, there is uh, something called hypochlorous acid, HOCl, that can be used um, on surfaces. It kills mold immediately, okay? Some people are using it in, in the vaporizers so that they're breathing it in, okay? Not over it, but just putting it into the room. Uh, and that will also get into various areas where the mold might be hidden, kill it like that. Okay, plus hypochlorous uh, acid has the acidity of like citrus juice. Okay, so we're not talking about a big acid. Okay, it, it tends to kill the mold on contact, even on your skin. Okay, you worry about the, uh, the coronavirus. It's already shown to be a very good antiviral. It's what your cells produce to kill viruses, okay? You're just giving it to yourself externally. Um, you can look it up. Uh, they do have it on Amazon. Looks like it's for animals, but it's a liquid. It's very, very easy to use. Um, mostly, you've got to get out of the environment or treat, mm -hmm. treat the mold. Uh, and that gets into, you know, if you have a home, uh, there are various um, things you can atomize, uh, something called concrobium, uh, which can, it, sometimes you can get it, sometimes you can in the UK, but you put that into a fogger and it gets in between the walls and it kills all the, kills all the mold. Um, they also have something called a mold bomb, which is again is a fogger. You would put it in an area where it can get in between the walls and that's where the mold is usually hanging out and you're being um, stimulated by the mold spores. So if your testing that you're doing shows a lot of like 15 or more mold spores that are growing, it, it's not really important the kind of mold, quite frankly. Just wanna, you want to get it. You want to get yeah. it in the environment. Okay. But unfortunately, no matter what you do, if you're being assaulted by this on a regular basis, okay, you want to remember, take care of the cells, take care of the gut, and whatever else needs to be balanced. Okay. But you're fighting something. It's like having chronic Lyme disease. You're fighting something on a regular basis. So that has to be taken care of also, but its effect has to be taken care of. So basically, glutathione and binders, and you're going to be ahead of the curve. Yeah. I'm one of the ones who react negatively to glutathione. <laughs> so okay, well, I get let me a tell terrible you, headache. Let, yeah. Okay. Let me tell you how to handle that then. Okay. Um, in that recycling pathway. Okay. Um, it, it's an NAD dependent pathway. Okay, uh, to get your mitochondria to work, to get that pathway in the mitochondria to work, you need things like NAD, which is B3, um, PQQ, coenzyme Q10, and a whole mess of other things. There is a, um, a patch, a transdermal patch, uh, from patch, uh, you can, it's from patch MD. You can either get it on Amazon, there's a place called patchworksuk.com, uh, also at Amrita Nutrition, and uh, it's a CoQ10 patch, okay? And it has everything that I just mentioned in this one little patch that, I'll show you the size of the patch. Um, this is a different patch, but they all look the same, okay? Okay, yeah. You know, now this is, this is an iron patch. Not gonna waste it, okay, all right? <laughs> and it absorbs through your skin in about eight hours. Now, they have a CoQ10 patch or an NAD total recovery patch. Either one of those two. If you did that for a couple of weeks, like one a day, and then try the glutathione again, small doses, mm -hmm. you'd be surprised because the recycling mechanism is now working because it has what it needs to work. Not only will that not be a problem, anymore your mitochondria will work better and remember that glutathione is your master antioxidant yeah. so once you get those things on you know on board you'd be surprised how well you can balance the system you know what i didn't say was if you want a, if you want a biochemical pathway to work what you have to do is not just concern yourself with the traffic but if you look at the pathway you need to give the body what it needs to have that pathway work in the, all the neurotransmitter pathways, it's always B1, B2, B3, sometimes B6, um, magnesium, manganese, and so forth. Uh, you need uh, iron and BH4. So if you start giving the body what it needs, it will start 
working. The funny thing is, is that we used to treat SNPs way back when. And I was the guy screaming at everybody, this is not going to work, guys. It's not the way it works. And as I was studying, I realized I still have this thing. Like, you, it used to be like a thing. Oh, yeah, everybody, every, every pathway needs to be one, be two. The fact is, if you can get that stuff into the cells, things will start working. The way you do that, one way, if you have a bad gut, is with transdermal patches. Okay, or liposomal products because it gets directly into the cells with liposomes. Yeah, and I've um, suspected a CoQ10 deficiency for a while. And over the summer last year, I had a really severe reaction to MS MSG. And I've. Glutamine. Yeah, yeah. So I've taken in the past L glutamine for gut healing and again developed headaches. But I went to a Thai restaurant when I was on holiday in the summer. I had like a. Um, a tamari duck it was absolutely delicious as i was eating it my brain was lighting up i was obsessed with it from the the first spoonful i had but then the next morning um we were driving back from cornwall so it was like an eight eight hour drive back to manchester and um i was with my family my mum was driving and i was like having seizures in the yeah. the the side of um in the passenger seat and at the yeah. time i didn't connect it but i know it was like excited I can never say it. Excitatory. Excitatory. You're saying it right. Yeah. It, specifically, that's glutamate. Yeah. Okay. Glutamate is broken down by uh, GAD, which is glutamate decarboxylase, which takes glutamate, turns it into GABA. Mm -hmm. Glutamate in high doses will cause seizures. Okay. How do you get glutamate? Well, glutamine mm -hmm. often, you know, mind you, the kind of people I tend to treat tend to have that particular polymorphism. So. I use something to fix a gut, which you'll see in my book called Gut Butter. Okay, since we're talking about the gut, let's 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 let me give you the big secret of life here. Okay, and I don't mean anything about Monty Python. You know, I won't go into the Monty Python. I'm very, I'm I'm really old, and I have a keyword brain. So I mean, I'm I'm a nut. I I watched. It scares my family because they'll mention something I'm like, "Oh, you want to know the song from Super Chicken?" Do, 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 you know, and it just comes out, and they're like. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, sorry, I just walk away, you know, but gut butter is, um, is a combination of products that you can mix up yourself and it includes olive oil and either organic butter, salted butter, uh, or coconut oil or something, you know, to put the dairy sensitive, a couple of tablespoons of natural honey unprocessed. Okay. And then added to that, uh, zinc L-carnosine. Um, I have a little formula. It's in my book. Uh, how many capsules of it you would put in? You're going to put this in a blender. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, butyrate, which you really need to look for the liquid butyrate because butyrate smells terrible. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I did that one. Oh, that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know something? That when I put it in, when I first did this formula, I opened up the butyrate capsules and I'm, I, I'm like, who dragged the body in here and killed it, you know? And I cleaned the kitchen and I still smelled it. And I cleaned the kitchen again and I still smelled it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, is it in my nose or something? What it was, was I was opening uh, capsules over a dish towel. And even though I was being careful, guess what? It was on a dish towel. I smelled it days later. I'm like, ah! So I put it in like a plastic bag. I threw it in the trash. Well, I could see the trash from, you know, because I was on the second floor, you know? And I saw animals walking by the trash going, I don't know what that is. Keep but I'm not going away. near it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, we got black bears here. You know, they're like black bears. They like that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, I ain't going near that. I ain't going near that at all. It don't smell right. You know, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> okay. So there is a liquid butyrate made by, um, by pure encapsulations. Uh, there's another one uh, made by Douglas Labs. It's an MCT and, and some butyrate and it tastes fine. It's beautiful. You know, it's got a little blueberry taste to it. So I use about an ounce of that in there. Um, something called Sialex, which is sialic acid which has, uh, which I use for mucin, and it's better than the fructooligosaccharides because it doesn't feed SIBO or anything. It also has a whole mess of other great, um, uh, great benefits. And, uh, a couple, and, and a couple of other products that you put in there, and then you put it in your blender, and you, you spin it up, okay, for a couple of minutes. You put this in a jar, okay, put it in the fridge, and it will solidify. And then because it layers a little bit, you want to mix it up one tablespoon a day of this stuff okay and my worst cases case my worst cases are getting better because what it's doing is it's sealing the gut quicker than i've ever seen before and i've been treating before the whole thing on leaky gut i was the guy screaming about it 20 years ago 25 years ago and so i've gone through a lot of different changes when it concerns 
sealing the gut or treating leaky gut. And also you have to take digestive enzymes to. Mm-hmm. So you gotta think about it. If a leaky gut, all the antigens getting through the gut barrier is what's causing the immune system to go wonky. You can't change all those memory cells, but you can change the entry of the antigens. So if you can seal the gut, the antigens aren't gonna get through. They'll get stuck in the mucus layer like they're supposed to, but they're not gonna get through and you're not gonna get the reactions and guess what's gonna happen? Your symptoms are gonna start getting better. Those people who can only eat three or four foods are gonna start being able to eat other foods. And you be, your body will not have so much inflammation so it can start healing and other things that you've done to try to do your healing are gonna start working, okay? Awesome. With yeah. just the, the uh, initiation and, you know, I'm happy to send you the uh, formula and you can send it out to anybody because this is not a, se- not a secret, mm-hmm. okay? I, don't, I intend it not to be a secret. Okay, it's not my secret formula. It's something that when I find something that heals people, mm-hmm. I send it out to yeah. everybody, yeah. okay? And um, I used to, you know, and, and in, uh, in, I think in my book, I had a lot of different variations because I have patients all over the world. So, you know, if I, I even have a Tasmanian version. <laughs> I have a patient in Tasmania. You know, and, I, and all I can think of is the Tasmanian devil. Yeah. You know, rah, 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 rabbit sandwich. And, I, I'm fr- and so I sent her the Tasmanian version with a picture of Taz on it. And her and her husband just keeled over laughing. And what I meant by that is I, I found the products that she could access, mm. you know, from Australia and New Zealand and stuff. And like I'll have people in Poland say, what is that? I do not know. I'm like, okay, what is this Tasmanian thing? I'm like, give me a break, okay? <laughs> you know? I used to go to I was used to go to Poland to treat autistic children, and you know you walk in they're like what are you doing here? I'm like well, I'm, I'm, you can't tell them I'm here to visit. How long will you be here? I'm like two weeks. Have you found moose and squirrel? I'm like no. <laughs> okay. If you find moose and squirrel, you tell me big reward. Here, come in, spend money. I'm like okay. Well, they didn't understand the joke, you know, about Rocky and Bullwinkle and moose and squirrel, right? Because they sounded to me like what is better enough. So it is like Boris Badenov, world's greatest no good dick, with his psychic Natasha and the boss, Mr. Dick, and Phyllis Lido. So they didn't understand it. I was like, why did you guys not watch cartoons when you were children? <laughs> Jess, when we were children, this was communist country. I was like, oh, <laughs> excuse me for asking. You know? <laughs> okay. But you, you know, by the way, I joke about everything. Okay? Yeah, you're so I funny. Have, I, have a great, I have a great belief that we should laugh at our enemies. Yeah. If we laugh at our enemies, it takes away their power. When I get rid of a bully, punch you in the nose. Mm-hmm. Okay. If someone, you know, if you are assaulted by, you have ME, you have chronic fatigue, you have anxiety, depression, you have something holding on to you. You don't know who it is. Okay. And you have no power. If you know who it is, and if you know who it is, then you know what to do. Then you've got it by the throat. And it should be afraid, very afraid. So first thing you do is laugh at it because there's nothing that I've met that can't be dealt with, cured most of the time, okay? That goes for my Tasmanian patient has cancer that has slowed down to a crawl, if not, you know, and all we did was support the immune system and get rid of all the triggers, things that would create the cell danger response, which ends up in things like cancer, Mm -hmm. things like autism, things like... So if we do anything here, let's remember that if you want to get better, the whole, you fix the body from its base, from its foundation, and take care of the root causes, and treat. You know, if you had PTSD, you still have to treat it. But the reason um, it doesn't get better is because its effect on the body has never been resolved. Treat it all, and then you can go on with your life. Yeah. People think these conditions like cancer just appear, like it's bad luck. Sorry, it's um something that you're gonna have to deal with. It's the may or may the, not be a cure, but right, you roll of the cosmic dice, you yeah. know. And that's not it's just not uh, I'm sorry. The whole point, the whole we live unfortunately in a chronic illness society, which has been promulgated by the medical profession, which has been under the influence of Big Pharma. Because let's face it, according to Big Pharma, a cured patient is a lost customer. Why would they want to do that? Okay, so you wonder why they fight against Lyme disease and stuff? Because they would rather treat the results of Lyme disease. They'd rather treat 
the chronic fatigue. They'd rather treat the fibromyalgia. They'd rather treat the neuropsychiatric problems because they're going to make a ton of money by giving you Lyric and gab gabapentin, you know, uh, and all the various antipsychotic drugs. You know, hey, I'm going to give you an antidepressant, which is usually an SSRI. It's serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Okay, and if that doesn't work, we'll try, uh, we'll, we'll just double the dosage. If that doesn't work, we'll try a different one. If that doesn't work, we'll try yet a different one. If that doesn't work, maybe we'll try, you know, a SNRI, an SDRI. We'll try raising dopamine and, and um, epinephrine. Okay, mm -hmm. if that doesn't work, let's give you an, anti, an atypical antipsychotic. Are you nuts? Mm -hmm. You know, you know what's wrong, but believe it or not, most medical doctors haven't, mind you, these guys, are not, these guys and gals are not stupid. I am not anti-medicine, okay? I feel badly, honestly, I do, because they're being forced into a situation where they are not allowed to be doctors anymore. If you're only allowed eight minutes a patient, the, the best you can do, if you're lucky, is handle part of the chief complaint. You're certainly not going to be able to take a good history. You're certainly not being able to do a good investigation. And they're being prevented from doing proper investigations. And after a little while, you know, that's the way it is. You know, you just can't live any other way. Then, and guess what? They're not stupid, okay? They're being forced into it. We, as naturalists, have the opportunity to be the person to go to to put the puzzle pieces together because we have the time, the knowledge, we have the tools, we've got the talent, okay? And we have the motivation to do it, all right? Great. And we will look at both ends of the scale, you know? Listen, I see somebody with a beefy red throat and I know it's strep. I'm not an idiot. I'm sending you for an antibiotic, okay? I can take care of what the antibiotic does, but if I don't take care of the strep throat correctly, that young woman who I may be talking to may get uh, rheumatic fever, which will result in rheumatic heart disease. And when she decides to have a family, because of the damage in her, um, um, in her um, uh, cardiac valves because of the rheumatic fever. She's going to have pulmonary edema and possibly die in the third trimester because I'm an idiot. Okay? If somebody needs an antibiotic, if they have cellulitis or something, they get an antibiotic. Okay? And I'm going to help them take care of what the antibiotic does to them and allow that body to heal again. Okay? As naturalists, we are enjoined to be the best providers that we can be. We can't live on our you know, in our ivory towers either. We're the ones that have to be the patient's advocates. And we are, because nobody else seems to be doing that role anymore. And by the way, we're motivated to do it. We love working with people. We really do. I mean, I have a, yeah. I have a ball. I, mean, <laughs> I know, I can tell. So popular. You know? <laughs> I really do. I mean, I love taking care of, I love putting puzzle pieces together because I'll listen to somebody's history and I'm like, oh, okay. I see what, how that happened, where that happened. And now I see the cascade. But since they're looking at it from the end results, it becomes very confusing for them. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. And then when it's confusing, it's scary. And what's a scary? Once you get that frightened, you turn your immune system off. Okay, that whole psychoneuroimmunology thing that started in the 70s happens to be true. The more frightened you get about something, the more nervous, the more power is taken away from you, the less your immune system works. So sometimes, have you ever heard of people Going into a going, you know, into a hospital or going to a doctor, they get a diagnosis of cancer and they're dead three weeks later. That's like a common thing. Is it the cancer that kills them or is it the diagnosis of cancer? Yeah. Because once they get that, it's a death sentence. They turn their immune system off, and that just says to the cancer, "Hey, hey, ha, ha, we have free reign. Let's go." Mm -hmm. And then, boom. I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox again. No, I love it. <laughs> like I said, we could we could chat for like three three days, I'm sure. And there's and a whole you... <laughs> yeah, yes, there's a book on um, I forgot the name of it right now, but like people who are given a false diagnosis and an inaccurate diagnosis of cancer, and then they die, or their hair starts falling out, and it wasn't even the case in the first place. Like crazy stuff right. like that. Yeah, it's and true. It's true. I'm not anti medicine either. There's a time and a place, and the National Health Service, it gets a lot of um, bad rap these days, but it works for acute illnesses. And um, if you get hit by a car, like, great, I want to be strict to A&E, not a acupuncturist. But True. yeah, the more chronic... The acupuncturist helps sew you together. That's yeah, <laughs> maybe I'll go to them afterwards, but not right, right away. Right, um, exactly. But more of the chronic lifestyle-driven conditions, this is where natural naturopathic medicine really shines. Exactly, um, exactly. But last area that I wanted to touch on would be antibiotic usage for Lyme disease what's what's your thoughts there like is that a place where you'd use or um 
advise your clients or patients to go ahead or do you have natural I have a, I have a I have a you know a lot of patients with Lyme disease it's one of those things that you have to look for and there's basically four different things you can do um, and I, I present this to, I present the options to my patients um, when there's options to be had uh, if you choose the medical route it will be antibiotics okay I usually doxycycline is what they start with but depending on who you see, maybe various antibiotics rotating, which can be oral or IV. In the natural medicine world or alternative medicine world, there are um, various herbal combinations, Buner, um, Byron White, and so forth. They have their own protocols with various types of herbs that are just as effective, by the way, okay? And just because something's an herb doesn't make it non it doesn't make it safe, okay? Mm -hmm. It still has to be done with supervision. And you have to do the foundational work with it, okay? Um, so there are, there's those choices. Uh, I have a middle-of-the-road choice because I'm a great believer in the fact that you may have Lyme disease, but I guarantee you have other things too. I've never met a person with one thing. By the way, Lyme is not one microorganism. You're talking about Borrelia burgdorferi but we can also have Borrelia celli, Borrelia stricosensu. There's a lot of people in the Borrelia realm, not to mention Babesia, Bardinella, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and need I go on, okay? So in those tick-borne diseases, okay, there are, you're not gonna get one thing. If you have one thing, guarantee you've got others. And you may have downstream effects like chronic candida, chronic viral illnesses, parasites, and so forth. So my middle-of-the-road approaches will include things like um, it, various combinations of things that may include things like colloidal silver or something like biocidin or a liposomal artemisian. And I often use MMS, which is, I, I know has a lot of bad press, uh, which is chlorine dioxide, uh, which works incredibly well on um, killing loads of different things without hurting the person, especially if you use it correctly. Okay. And of course, there's a whole mess of uh, people out there say, you're giving people bleach. I'm like, Give me a break, all right? By the way, chlorine, when I was in the Army a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> okay, when we wanted to purify water, we used iodine tablets because you'd shake it up, wait a little while, and you'd be able to drink the water. It tastes a little bit like iodine, but, you know, at least you didn't get dysentery. These days, they use water purification tablets, which are chlorine dioxide. Same thing, okay? Drop five or six capsules in your uh, in your canteen, shake it up, wait a couple of hours, and you can drink the water. It tastes a little bit like bleach, just a little bit, okay, but you won't get dysentery. So on the one hand, that same solution, I can give my soldiers, my Boy Scouts, and everything else. But if I use it with a kid with autism to kill multiple things, I'm killing them. Mm -hmm. Guess why? You're just hearing about politics. Yeah. On the other hand, Lyme disease can be very well treated with the bioresonance machines, Rife, Spooky 2, so forth. Now, again, um, these things, you know, require either trials of it and so forth. It'd be helpful if you had somebody who knew what they were doing to advise you. But of those people who I've seen that nothing else seems to work, those machines work very well. Okay, and what are they doing? They're sending electrical impulses into the body that are making various microorganisms burst. How does it do that? Okay, well, think about the opera singer who can sing a note that I can't sing, okay, and take a lead crystal and make it burst. What is that doing? It's making, it's a sympathetic vibration that's causing the molecules to shake so hard that they actually lose cohesion. Dr. Reif found all the frequencies that allowed it to kill pathogens, but not the regular cells, because they're at different frequencies, they're at different vibrations, they have different charges on it, which is why like things like colloidal silver will attack the pathogens, but not the good cells. That's why MMS or chlorine dioxide attacks the pathogens, but not the good cells. Okay, so in the Lyme disease world, do I always go for antibiotics? No. Do I always go for the alternative medicine? No. I present it to my patients and I literally say, here's your stuff, research it, get back with me. And if they decide to go the antibiotic route, I will help them maintain their health. I will help them do the foundational work. I will compensate for the antibiotics. I never tell my patients, if they decide to go in a certain direction, I walk the path with them. On the other hand, if they're doing any of these other things, I will give them a program that includes a foundation, includes the foundational program, and then monitor them at, at fairly regular intervals 
as we're getting rid of it. Chronic Lyme disease of whatever ilk is one of the banes of our society, okay? And chronic parasitic illness is a bigger problem because the tests for parasites are terrible. Lots of false negatives, uh, false negatives out there. Uh, you know Armin Labs? Mm-hmm. Okay, Armin Schwarzbach, I won't say that he's a friend of mine. We've had several conversations. Yeah. Very nice man, very nice man. And we had, uh, had discussed one time the, the, you know, the role of parasites. And he agreed that parasites is probably a bigger problem than, uh, than Lyme disease. And the other problem that is very ubiquitous are, are chronic viral illnesses, okay, including the herpetic illnesses. There's like 10 different herpes. Uh, EBV is, is important, but the master virus is more herpes than it is EBV because of the various forms. And the HHV 6, 7, and 8 are more in the brain, okay? And you tend to see them in conjunction with other illnesses. This is why you have to have a broad, this is why you need to have an eclectic broad approach, just like you have when you're, when you're treating somebody. Because you, if you're gonna in the diagnostic mode, you have to be considering a lot of stuff. But remember, that's only half the, half the uh, battle. Treatment has to be done, you always have to treat the foundation, you always have to treat the effects of the root causes and treat the root causes. Okay, great, you can, put, you can cobble together something like that, but then the art is, when do you do what? In what order do you treat? Because you can do the right thing at the wrong time. That's what it takes a professional like yourself and me to work on. Because you have to look at the person's whole condition before you decide what to do first. You try and work by protocol. People are reading articles and stuff. That's why stuff doesn't work and hurts them. Because they may be doing the right thing, but they're taking care of one little piece of something where they need a, need a broader approach. So if you have anxiety and depression and stuff like that, there's nothing wrong with your ability to handle life. Yes, it may be a result of various stressors, whether they be microbial, toxic, or psychological, but the end result is <clears throat> you have to treat the body. That's what gets rid of it. And you have to go into the history and look at what might be causing it and start correcting. And if you don't know what to correct, start at the base. Start with uh, your digestion and your gut and getting vitamins and minerals into your cells by whatever method. Okay, and work your way out of that. 90% of the time, that's going to take care of it. Okay, but you still have to, you know, you have to consider everything. So if you're thinking backwards, if you're thinking from the inside out instead of from the outside in, you're on the right road. Mm-hmm. And the annoying thing is, though, like some of these things that you've mentioned, like how heavy metals affect the body and mold, the root causes of autism, um, the treatment of chlorine dioxide. If someone was to Google them, they're not going to find anything because of all of the, the censoring that's especially this past year, it's gone. It's crazy. And I, I interviewed um, Dr. Stephanie Seneff on my podcast. I, I, I interviewed her. She's a wonder, yeah. isn't she? Yeah. The episode She's actually amazing. was released today, uh, yesterday, sorry. And I was a little bit, cause she was mentioning some of those things and I hadn't really heard of the chlorine dioxide treatment before. But I was like, this information needs to be out there, so we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and post it because she's just yeah, she's the brain box, just a wealth of knowledge. She's um, a she's a PhD at M- at yeah. M- uh, MIT. Yes. And I remember several years ago having her on my podcast, and for two hours, all I did was go, yeah, really, seriously. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know that. Wow, for real? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's just so nice and so great. And then I was like, so what can we do about it? And you could hear her go, hmm, you know. <laughs> Seriously, because like glyphosate, which is where she, her expertise is, you know, which organophosphates, which is what destroys cells right at the mitochondria level, is pervasive. They're all over the place. They're in everything. Women are getting glyphosate levels from using tampons mm-hmm. because it's cotton in the tampons. So that's why you need the organic ones, you know, as silly as that sounds, but it's true. And I got to tell you, I've been in practice a good long time. Like, again, I keep saying, I guess. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to make anybody be impressed, but I want to let you know that I have historical perspective. In this time frame, I am treating more children than way back when. Children are getting sicker sometimes right out of the, right, right at the, in the neonatal portion because usually that's immunizations, but we didn't know that baby food had glyphosates in it until very recently, okay? So they would be, not every woman can breastfeed and not, uh, much to the chagrin of the La Leche League, not every woman can breastfeed, okay, adequately, for loads of different reasons. But the fact is, 
and, or they, they have to supplement the baby needs more. My son, Jesse, when he was a baby, by one week of age, he was looking, he was looking at my steak going, <laughs> he cried all the time, you know, and I told his mother, I said, look, he's hungry. And she was breastfeeding. No, no, he's got to have breast milk. And, I, and I, I snuck away and got a little, a little bit of the baby cereal, made it very, very <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Out. You know, I was like, <laughs> you know, he woke up and went, blah, 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 which means, yo. <laughs> yeah. the, fa the fact is that, you know, um, we didn't know. We didn't know what was in the cows, you know, that's coming out in the milk, you know? We didn't know that, uh, you know, Lyme disease can be transmitted through breast milk. That's being suppressed. can be transmitted sexually. That's being, that's being suppressed. It can get through the placenta. You have to realize that science isn't as pristine as you think. If you're going to depend on placebo-controlled double-blind studies, you're going, to be, you're going to be confused for a couple of reasons. Number one, two, three. Like money python no two no three okay uh, one reason is uh, first off in scientific studies what you're doing is cutting out you're, you're studying something you cut out as many variables as possible okay and then you come up with a conclusion and then you publish that well they give me that information now i have to apply it to a person with innumerable variables and then they get mad at me okay i'm like but, but you know they're like well that's not the way this works I said, no, no no wait i'm a clinician you're the researcher shut up okay and that they don't they don't even invite me to the parties anymore. They see me come, they just leave. You know, like here he comes. You know, so they get it. The second reason is it, it, uh, science is not pristine anymore. Okay, it used to be twenty years ago. If you went to a scientific symposium and the researcher was talking, he'd be like this, because you know nobody was supporting that. You know, now who's how many times have you heard that? Researchers or doctors are being thrown out of studies. They're thrown out of studies because they big pharma is not getting the answers they want. Okay, and yes, you know, once something comes out, how much how much are they you know injuring somebody? It's a little nuts. Okay, um, and you can't build a protocol on just the scientific studies because of the ina the inaccuracies. So you have to use your clinical acumen and you have to use your intuition at the same time. So you can't go just with scientific studies if you're trying if you're trying to treat somebody. You know, this is why I do the podcast like this to have experts in your field like yourself and um, maybe there's no scientific studies on some of these things but anecdotal evidence and just what you've experienced for the past few decades it is so important and anecdotal I, evidence is not a curse word yeah it is the beginning of research you notice an effect you notice a relationship okay and you always have to think like Sherlock Holmes you know if you rule out the impossible whatever's left however improbable must be the truth. If you see this causing that, you don't sit there and say that can't happen. You ask yourself, why does that happen? And then fix it. Mm -hmm. And I would love to have you back on again okay. in the future because there are so many different, so many more subjects and know that you specialize in many different other things. So um, yeah, if you're happy to come on again, we'll extend Always. the conversation, do a part two. Um, I'll gather some listener questions from this episode and see what people want to learn more about. But this has been absolutely amazing. And it's been one of my favorite episodes that I've recorded. I've done, I'm on like episode 50 something right now. And this has been like one of the best ones, if not the thank best. You. And, and you're, I, do, you're, doing, you're doing a good service for everybody. Thank you so much. And you should be congratulated for it. Seriously. Thank you. I know I used to have a podcast and, and I know how much work goes into this. Yeah, it is. It's my favorite part. It's one of my favorite parts of my job though. And it's really... Um, a little bit um, of a personal thing for me to gather a bit of information selfishly, mm -hmm. but I it's going to help. <laughs> yeah, it's going to help other people as well. So <laughs> I think everyone's going to benefit greatly from this. You're an amazing speaker, and the comedy side of it as well, I love because laughter is a huge part of medicine as well. It is. It yeah, is. and if people have been listening and they felt a little bit down and depressed when they started, I can guarantee <laughs> that they're feeling much better after listening to you. So thank you so much, Dr. Jeff. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.